Hey everyone, and welcome to this uh, short little brief history of ancient Mesopotamia and early civilization. Now we have to remember it's really difficult to put 8,000 years of history into a short 15 minute video, but we're going to try. Hence, that's why this video is called Highlights or a Brief History of Mesopotamia. Now there's a reason why most history books or history courses start with Mesopotamia. This is where most historians believe that the foundations of our modern civilization began. Now it's hard to put exact dates to events from ancient antiquity. All we know is that the world we're familiar with today in terms of geography really took shape after the end of the most recent ice age, about 12,000 years ago. With the polar ice caps melting and the gigantic glaciers of the world receding, sea levels began to rise. This actually flooded large parts of the earth that had at one time been filled with animals and prehistoric humans. As the seas rose, the famous land bridge between Asia and North America, today basically eastern Siberia and Alaska, disappeared. So too did the coastlines of both continents. The land which connected Britain to Europe also was gradually flooded, creating the English Channel. So too was the land between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. So I think you get the picture that the earth was physically different than it is today. The same held true for the region that we call the Near East, or also the Middle East. We're basically going to focus on this area, because it was here that around 7,000 years ago, the very beginnings of human civilization as we know it began to take form, and that the first collection of city-states fully emerged. Now, during this time, there were many different tribes scattered around the ancient Near East. Some of the ones that archaeologists have discovered have been named the Ubaid, the Hattusa, and there are actually countless others. You'd be surprised how many ancient peoples there were. Around 8,000 to 6,000 BCE, these tribes and groups of people began to settle down. Essentially, they were giving up their former nomadic hunter-gathering type of lifestyle and were settling in small, you could say, villages, mostly by streams and rivers. Now, the reason for this is because they had essentially discovered agriculture. Now, this was a big thing because instead of searching for food and hunting animals all the time, they could actually plant or essentially sow harvests to be reaped later on. In order to do this, they had to stay in one place. And of course, they had to live by rivers because those plants needed water. To aid them with this, they built uh, canals that brought water from the rivers, especially during times when the rivers would flood, into their fields. So this is really how the first settlements began. Now these settlements are important because they became the foundations of future cities. Sometime after 4000 BCE, a group of people known as the Sumerians created settlements along the Tigris or merged with the ones that were already there. By learning how and improving on the irrigation techniques that uh, were already there before them, the Sumerians were able to make the rich soil of southern Mesopotamia yield harvests large enough to support a relatively dense and growing population. Basically, they succeeded where others had failed in producing the first food surpluses in human history. With excess food supplies, human beings no longer had to spend every day of their lives hunting and gathering food. Instead, they had time to not only ponder the mysteries of the universe, but also develop new, practical technologies that could develop or improve their lives. So with these new technological advances, a new specialized society emerged with farmers, masons, carpenters, kings, soldiers, priests, teachers, artisans, and, with the invention of writing, scribes. In fact, the Sumerians are credited with being the first ancient civilization to develop and use writing. The earliest evidence that we have of this dates back to 3300 BCE and is contained in clay tablets found in the ruins of the city of Uruk. This early writing, known as cuneiform, took form by impressing pictographs and symbols on wet slabs of clay with a stylus. Initially, such tablets were used to keep records of agricultural surpluses, but later became the main medium for recording royal proclamations and laws, the history of oral epics, and other aspects of Sumerian civilization. By 3500 BCE, the Sumerians and several other peoples of Mesopotamia were living in fully urbanized centers with paved roads lined with simple adobe houses, common markets, large steppe pyramids known as ziggurats, palaces, and public squares. Some of the most ancient of these cities, at least the ones that we know about, were Irudu, Ur, and Uruk. 
the latter which in the 4th millennium BCE was believed to have been the largest urban area in the world at the time. Due to their location, these cities also acquired a great deal of wealth and possessed a relatively high degree of culture, at least for some of their citizens. In Uruk, for example, several royal tombs were found which contained golden objects, precious stones, ornately embroidered clothes, cosmetics, and even musical instruments. These objects are believed to have been placed into the tombs so that the deceased could take them on their journey into the afterlife. However, it was not just objects that were found in these tombs, but human remains of what are believed to have been servants. These servants were most likely soldiers, attendants, musicians, and concubines. It is believed that the royal patrons of these servants would need them in the world of the dead as much as they had in the world of the living. There's evidence that these servants drank poison before being entombed with their masters. Then as now, ideas and technologies didn't stay with one group of people for long. Others discovered or acquired them and oftentimes became even more powerful than the original users. This was definitely the case with another Mesopotamian people known as the Akkadians. In 2340 BCE, Sumer was conquered by Sargon of Akkad. The Akkadians were once a semi-nomadic people who had gradually settled on the outskirts of Mesopotamia proper. Sargon ruled from his capital known as Agade, also known as Akkad, which is believed to have been somewhere near the modern-day city of Baghdad. Of course, we've never found the actual remains of Akkad, but we have numerous inscriptions that refer to it, so we know it existed. Agade eventually became the center of trade and administration for the region with the Akkadian language replacing Sumerian, at least officially. It's likely, though, that most people were bilingual. They probably spoke Sumerian at home, and then the ruling class, who were the Akkadians, spoke both. According to the legends and secondary sources written after his death, Sargon came from humble origins. He was believed to have been the son of a gardener. The Sumerian king list, of which there are several versions, says that he had been the cupbearer of the king Ur-Zababa of the city of Kish, and eventually he went to seize the throne of another king, lugal Zagezi of Uruk. Sargon then shifted his capital to Agade and apparently ruled an empire that consisted of all of Mesopotamia and spanned from the Mediterranean to the borders of Iran. According to inscriptions that are believed to have been left by Sargon himself, the Akkadian king claims to have defeated some 50 other rulers during his conquest of Sumer and the regions leading to the Persian Gulf. According to the king list, he ruled this multi-ethnic empire, the first of its kind, somewhere for 54 to 56 years. We're not exactly sure of the dates. Though he founded his empire through conquest, its continued survival was due to trade. The Akkadian governors that Sargon appointed for his Sumerian conquests were instructed to tear down all of the walls around the cities. Sargon believed that not only would this prevent rebellions, but it would also make commerce easier between the regions of his new empire. In this, he was very successful, as Sargon's empire sent and received valuable goods such as grain, timber, and tin from areas as far away as Egypt and India. Now, though Sargon appears to have had the power and charisma to have held his empire together, his successors proved to not have been as capable as ruling as he was. After just a hundred years, the Akkadian Empire was overrun by a people known as the Gutians, after which a short, dark age settled over Mesopotamia. At least this is what the scribes and chroniclers of the age describe. It could just be that no one could compare to Sargon, since after his death, he was regarded more like a god than a man. Divinity aside, Sargon's empire created a workable bureaucracy that laid strong foundations for other empires that would follow him. Around 2000 BCE, a new era began in Mesopotamia. After countless wars and perhaps decline caused by environmental factors, the old cities of Sumer began to be eclipsed by other ones that were being founded by new arrivals to the region. Among these were the Babylonians and later the Assyrians. For the next 400 years, several dynasties vied for power over Mesopotamia. Each was based in a particular city-state, with the most powerful of them being Babylon, Ashur, Mari, Larsa, and Isin. These new dynasties were all of Amorite descent. The Amorites were a group of Semitic tribes that had migrated and later settled in and around Mesopotamia during the 3rd millennium BCE. They are believed to have come from the west, possibly as far as the biblical land of Canaan. 
The first great tribe of the Amorites to rule over large swaths of Mesopotamia were the Assyrians. One of their kings, Shamsi Abad, built up his empire not only through the strength of his military, but like Sargon before him, through trade, especially with Anatolia and to the northwest. When Shamsi Adad died in 1781 BCE, another Amorite power to the south was already on the rise, the city-state of Babylon. The man who is credited for its rise is the famous Hammurabi. Hammurabi was unique in that he was both a warrior and a scholar. His most famous contribution to human history is his Code of Laws, commonly referred to as Hammurabi's Code. This legal document, if you could call it that, covered a host of issues as varied as pricing of agricultural goods, um, consumer protection, and also brutal capital punishments. Hammurabi also was a great patron of mathematics, astronomy, astrology, and the sciences. It's believed that during his reign, the numbering system based on 60 that we use today was developed. Assyria and Babylonia constantly vied for influence over Mesopotamia. Eventually, the two more or less coalesced with each other. The Assyrians were known more for their wealth and military might, while the Babylonians were viewed more as, well, you could say high culture snobs. However, in 1595, both areas were overrun by invaders from Anatolia, the Hittites. Now, the Hittites are an Indo-European people that are believed to have come onto the scene around 1600 BCE. Their initial stronghold was the city of Hattusa, today in central Anatolia, near the modern-day city of Bogazakale. I'm really sorry, my Turkish isn't that good, and I always slaughter that name. Anyway, this was a tough, harsh, and mountainous region, which undoubtedly rubbed off on all of the people who lived there. Thus, it was only natural that a warlike people, such as the Hittites, would be inclined to invade and reap the rewards of greener pastures to the south. Eventually, they expanded and created an empire that dominated Anatolia, the eastern Mediterranean, and also threatened the ancient but powerful kingdom of Egypt. Now, as warriors, the Hittites were among the most efficient and lethal of the ancient world. They are also believed to have been among the first peoples to adopt the horse-drawn chariot as a means of attack. Between the years 1658 and 1200 BCE, the Hittite Empire was ruled by a single great king and a centralized government. To help them to administrate their many territories, the Hittites developed a system of client kingdoms, kind of like vassals, who were to swear their loyalty and arms to the great king, often by paying tribute, providing soldiers, and wives for marriage. It was a system that seemed to work for several centuries until it didn't. This was probably the result of several things all occurring around the same time, including growing instability, famine, and constant warring with other neighboring states. Both the Egyptians and the Assyrians had also reasserted themselves militarily, thus putting pressure on the Hittite military machine and gobbling up their territory and client kings. By around 1200 BCE, the Hittites were basically out of luck, out of wealth, and most importantly, out of power. Now the Hittites were brutal, no doubt, but they paled in comparison to the Assyrians. These were the people who made it a sport of massacring people, carrying the survivors into slavery, and turning once thriving cities into wastelands. For themselves though, the Assyrians built some pretty exquisite cities, such as Nineveh and the historical capital of Ashur. These and other Assyrian cities contained beautiful palaces, temples, and libraries. In fact, much of what we know about the Akkadians and the early peoples of Mesopotamia comes from the texts discovered in the ruins of Nineveh's library. When the Assyrians weren't out killing and looting, they enjoyed a pretty high standard of living and culture. Through a policy of fear and intimidation, the Assyrians were able to hold on to their empire for several hundred years. Yet like the empires before it, the Assyrian one grew too big for its britches. That, along with ruling over populations who totally despised them, brought about their destruction. This was done through an alliance between the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and the Medes, an Indo-European confederation to the east that was also a relative newcomer to the Mesopotamian scene. In 612 BCE, they destroyed Nineveh and three years later, Ashur. This Neo-Babylonian Chaldean dynasty rebuilt Babylon into possibly the ancient world's most wealthy and beautiful city. This though was not done through the efforts of the Babylonians themselves. They relied heavily on the labor of conquered slaves. This was the empire of Nebuchadnezzar II, 
Infamous for his destruction of Jerusalem and the enslavement of his population in 597 BCE, but also well known as the builder of the famous and legendary Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Now, the Neo Babylonian Empire, or the Chaldean Empire, was short lived. After just 60 years, they and the old order of Mesopotamia fell to the Persians and their king, Cyrus the Great. This changed Mesopotamia and really the world forever. And it's also another topic that we'll get into in future episodes. Thanks for watching and listening to this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment. If you're uh, interested in future videos, please subscribe. And thanks again.